Welcome to worship on this Sunday, March 21st. If you are new to our congregation, please visit our website and you can learn more about our church and our ministry there. You can find uh, media resources and all kinds of things. I know this is not St. Patrick's Day anymore, but I am recording this message on St. Patrick's Day and as you can see, I am in the spirit. I know many of our congregation have already been vaccinated for COVID-19 and that is great news. I want to encourage everyone to be vaccinated as soon as you are able to as a way of stopping the spread of this virus and because if you do that, then we can speed the time when we will be able to return and see one another and greet one another with more normalcy and, uh, and have live services safely. There is a disturbingly large number of people in our nation who are resisting the vaccination. But let's not join with those who have accepted the conspiracy theories, please. Thank God instead for the dedicated scientists and medical professionals who have worked so hard to save lives and who have developed multiple safe and effective vaccines. I'm scheduled to have mine today, St. Patrick's Day. Next Sunday is already Palm Sunday and then begins Holy Week. And during Holy Week, we will be holding a Monday Thursday communion self-guided service here in the sanctuary. We will schedule times for people to come and par participate just like we did at the Christmas Stations of the Nativity. And that way we'll be COVID safe. For Good Friday, I will be posting a Ten Embrace service that Sandra and I created last year on YouTube. It's a little bit out of focus because it was the first attempt we did uh, at a video service. It was actually a full year ago that we created this service, the first full video service after closing our doors. The Tenebrae is a service of scripture, song, and candlelight to reflect on Jesus' suffering and death for Good Friday. On Easter Sunday, I will be posting a sunrise service that will be the easiest sunrise you ever got up for because you can start it whenever you are ready in the morning. The sun is actually going to stand still until you are ready. We are then going to have our first in-person worship service after more than a year at 11 o'clock on Easter Sunday outside the front doors of the church. You will need to wear a mask and we will be social, socially distancing, but we are looking forward to a service together. If the weather is too bad for an outdoor service, we will move it inside and refrain from singing, unfortunately. You are also invited to come earlier at 10.30 to decorate the flowering cross and see people before the service begins. God bless you today as we worship together. Our call to worship. Holy One, dwell within us. Whisper in our ears, glimmer in our vision, write upon our hearts. We wait with open ears, open eyes, and open hearts.
Woohoo! Hey, kids. Hey, look at that. Twice. Oh, three. Four. Four and a half. Five and four. I don't know what that is. Uh, it's going again. Hey, I'm getting it. I'm getting the hang of it. It's been a long time since I've done the yo-yo. I used to do these as a kid. And I saw this yo-yo at, what is it called? Yeah, dollar store. And I had to get it because it's green. That's the only reason. It's a green yo-yo. Look at that, it just keeps on going. Oh, there it goes. That's, I'm, I'm way out of practice, but I was impressed with myself. I got this green yo-yo because I'm in a St. Patrick's kind of mood. Do you notice? I've got a green hat, I've got a green bow tie, a green shirt, green pants, green wool socks. Can you see them? Everything's green about me today. Green, the color of money, right? Money. Yeah. You know what St. Patrick's Day is famous for? Is leprechauns. Leprechauns, you know what they have? They have a lot of money. They've got a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That's what the story always says. Well, I just brought that up because I thought about the story that Jesus tells that we're going to look at in the sermon is about a story where someone has 10,000 bags of gold. 10,000 bags, imagine that. That's a whole lot of gold. But the story is actually not about the gold. The gold is not what we should be after. What we should be after is God and forgiving one another when we've hurt one another and loving one another and, and living the way God wants us to. And that's what Jesus tells us about in his story, is how to love God and how to love one another and how to forgive one another. And gold sometimes can just get in the way and cause problems if all of our desire is, is for gold. And uh, so, if we think about St. Patrick's Day and leprechauns in Ireland, and somehow those two have gotten mixed together, St. Patrick's Day is actually about a saint who didn't pursue gold, but he pursued the love of God. And St. Patrick uh, is a good model for us, not so much the leprechauns who hoard their gold in pots, but anyway... I just want to encourage you on St. Patrick's Day to think of someone who loved God so much that he served and loved his neighbors and, and he went and offered his life uh, to help other people know who God is. And so let's give thanks and hope you have fun. Oh, I'm going to get this going again. Well, maybe I'll be better at it later. See ya.
Prayer, please respond. Having mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness, in your great compassion, hear our prayers. We pray for the whole church, all the leaders and ministers, and all the holy people of God. Wash us through and through and cleanse us from our sins. We pray for our nation, for all the nations of all the earth and for all those who govern and judge, purge us from our sin, and we shall be purged. We pray for those who hunger, those who thirst, those who cry out for justice, those who live under the threat of terror, and for those without a place to lay their head, make them hear of joy and gladness that those who are broken may rejoice. We pray for those who are ill, those in pain, those under stress, and those who are lonely. Give them the joy of your saving help and sustain them with your bountiful spirit. In this season of Lent, we pray that we all might be given the grace and the strength to repent and grow closer to you, O God. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. We pray, we pray for those who have died and who have entered into the land of the eternal light. And your abiding peace, cast them not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit with them. Here are private prayers for. Lord Jesus, you taught your disciples that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And as we prepare our hearts to remember your death and resurrection, grant us the strength and wisdom to serve and follow you this day and always. Amen.
Our scripture lesson today comes from Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Please listen for God's word to us. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay his debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took a pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had the mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owned. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. In today's parable, we see a story full of twists and shocking images of torture and selling children even into slavery to pay off a debt. Most Bibles give a title to this parable, calling it the unmerciful servant. And we can see why. The servant is glad to receive mercy, but he is brutal toward his fellow servant. All of the shocking imagery can give you the wrong idea if, if you don't pay attention to why Jesus tells the story in the first place. Let's look at that context before we dig into the parable itself. Peter is asking Jesus about forgiveness. To be precise, Peter is wanting to know just how far to go with this forgiveness idea that Jesus just seems to dispense everywhere he goes. Peter is not asking Jesus, how much is God willing to forgive me, but how much he, Peter, has to be willing to forgive someone else. He asks the question with a pretty precise idea of what maybe would be necessary as if he is quite proud of how much the whole idea of grace has stretched his thinking and his heart. He says, probably with a self-satisfied smugness about it, should I go as far as forgiving someone seven times? I'm guessing that Peter was asking this question in front of the other disciples who he hoped to shock with this radical grace that he has now grown into. After all, many rabbis that they had heard teach about the subject of forgiveness had challenged them to go as far as forgiving someone up to three times. Peter must have sensed that Jesus intended them to learn to forgive in even greater measure. He must have been proud of himself to suggest not just double what the ordinary rabbis were teaching, but even more than double their limit. 
Peter wants to appear abundantly gracious as he asks the question, offering to forgive another person up to seven times. Seven, after all, is the symbolic number of perfection in the Hebrew Bible, perfection or of completeness. That's the number of days that it took God to create the world in the story we find in Genesis. That's the number of churches in the book of Revelation representing the complete church throughout the world. So Peter surely thought that seven times was perfection itself. Maybe you are already laughing at Peter because you know where this is going, right? Peter is about to be stretched by God's love and forgiveness in proportions beyond all imagination. But don't judge Peter for his small-mindedness or his hard heart. Aren't we just like Peter? In fact, aren't we just like the ordinary rabbi when we accept and practice the three strikes and you're out rule? We've made it into a modern proverb even, haven't we? When someone commits an offense against us, we think of baseball because we're good Americans. That's strike one, we say to ourselves. We would consider it foolish to let a person offend us over and over again. But Jesus responds to Peter, no, not seven times, 77 times. Jesus' answer to Peter was not just pushing the limit to an even harder uh, number to keep track of. If you're keeping a ledger and you just add 70 more lines to cover all the additional offenses that Jesus just allowed, then you miss the point. Jesus is throwing the ledger completely out. There is no limit. Forgiveness is always the way. If you're laughing at Peter for his self-righteous pride, then you are in the right mood to read the parable that comes next that Jesus tells as an illustration. You cannot understand this parable if you have missed the point so far. If you have just added 70 lines to your ledger, then the story Jesus tells is actually going to have an ugly meaning. You have to be laughing to read or to hear this story in the right tone. Jesus illustrates what he has just told Peter by telling us a story of absolutely bizarre proportions. The kingdom of God, he says, is like a king. Now, please, don't assume immediately that Jesus is saying God is just like this king in the story. Jesus is not just painting a picture of God in the form of a human monarch. Jesus is telling us a story about what an ancient king was like, and in a strange twist, that story is going to show us a king surprising us with an amazing moment of grace and just a glimpse of what God is like. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who has a long, long ledger of accounts with some of his indebted servants. And now he has decided to collect what he is owed. Now here comes the enormous twist. The servant in this story, a humble servant, owes this king a debt unthinkably large. Our translation says 10,000 bags of gold. Now, how did one single servant accumulate a debt of such astronomical proportions? That might sound like the cost of a house out here on the North Coast, but this is no mortgage on his home. It is more like our entire national debt. In other words, this is truly a debt beyond comprehension for any of the folks that Jesus was speaking to. Jesus was responding to Peter, a fisherman, a blue-collar laborer, and maybe to others like Peter who all lived at a subsistence level. They must have been grinning in amusement at the thought of such huge piles of gold the images that might come to our mind in our world today would be Walt Disney's cave of treasure in that great 
uh, children's movie Aladdin, or Smog's vast treasure in The Hobbit. Such a disproportionate wealth to anything experienced by the people around Jesus should grab your attention. Because if you remember the parables from last week's message, Jesus was comparing the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed and to wheat. These very familiar, very simple images, familiar in those people's experience. For Jesus to talk about this enormous wealth is setting up a huge joke, and everybody knows it. What? 10,000 bags of gold? Where's this story going? Even a king would be desperate to get that money back. And what does this king do? At first, he does exactly what any ancient monarch might be expected to do when he doesn't get what he wants. When the servant can't pay this ridiculous sum, the king decides to sell the servant and his wife and even his children into slavery and take what he can get. That is exactly what you would expect a king to do, to be merciless and brutally unforgiving. But wait, the servant wails in distress and pleads for mercy, and lo and behold, the king is filled with pity for the servant, and in an instant, he completely wipes out the entire debt. All 10,000 bags of gold are just written off. Remember, there is no tax write-off for that loss. The king is not going to somehow benefit. He is the government. And that was enough gold for an empire to go to war over. But this king just forgives every penny. Do you feel the tone of the story? Jesus is having some fun here. Everyone must have been laughing at the lavish change of heart for such a tyrant. Now something is shining through in the picture. This is where we see God's kingdom, not in the normal expectation of a powerful king exerting his authority, but in the unimaginable mercy that no one would ever have dreamed of. Does God forgive our debts, our sins, with such extravagant grace? Is that picture coming through? I hope so. That's what we should see. But Jesus hasn't finished his story. The king who would we would naturally expect to be merciless has shown mercy beyond measure. The servant, however, immediately goes out into the street and is more brutal than the king ever dreamed of being. He finds a person who owes him a relatively small debt, something within a humble person's experience something that they might have owed to one another. He is a person just struggling to put food on the table, a common man who cannot repay his debt. And our servant has no mercy toward his fellow servant. He grabs him by the neck and he is choking him as if he is a gangster who gets paid or he'll break your bones. He could be portrayed well by Robert De Niro when the poor man can't pay, he has him thrown into jail until he can pay back his debt. And how can you pay back your debt from prison? You can't. Now the audience goes from laughing at the wondrous grace displayed by a tyrant to feeling uncomfortably familiar with the struggle to pay small debts or with the anger they feel toward people that they have personally helped with small loans, but yet are waiting to be repaid. Peter and whoever else was listening must have been doing some real self-examination at this point, right? Just consider this. What did I say to Zach the other day about that hammer he borrowed five months ago? Is Jesus talking about me and my unforgiving attitude? Yes, he is. 
Jesus uses this extreme story of debt and forgiveness to open a window on our more mundane experience and our more normal offenses. In the extreme, we see a glimpse of God's grace and a taste of what it would look like to exercise grace in our more normal mundane experiences. But then we see the extreme brutality of the guy who is like us, and we feel righteous anger growing toward this ridiculous servant. But then we realize we are that ridiculous servant. We are the one who finds it so impossible to forgive others for the small infractions and offenses that they may have committed against us. We feel justified in demanding either payment for the wrongs or retribution. And just as we are feeling these things, Jesus goes on with the story. The king has heard what the servant did immediately after being forgiven that enormous debt, right? And now, now the king is going to do what we expect from a tyrant. He is going to take this miserable servant and throw him in jail where he will be tortured. This is what kings in the ancient world really did. Torture was common. Even into the Middle Ages across Europe, uh, torture was normal. You can go visit the torture chambers that are still found in the, in the castles that you can have a tour guide explain to you the gruesome things that were done in those places to those miserable prisoners. The end of the story is the part that most of us struggle to understand. Jesus gives that ominous final warning to be careful to forgive one another because if we don't, God is going to treat us just like the king treated the wicked servant. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Is Jesus saying really that in the end, God is actually like that brutal monarch who tortures his enemies? If you don't catch the tone of the story from the beginning, I said, you might think that way, and it's actually an ugly result. But in fact, many Christians have believed that God is like that, and they fear God rather than love God. You must remember that the reason Jesus tells this story to, is to illustrate how many times we are to forgive one another if we are going to reflect God's true character. God is the one who forgives, not just three times, not just seven times, but 77 or 70 times seven, which is to say God never stops forgiving. Our offenses may be equal to not just an ordinary individual debt, but the entire national debt. And yet, with God, we will find mercy and forgiveness. That is the message. And Jesus is not taking it back when he gives the last line of that story. He is not revealing that God is like King Herod, for example, who maintains a torture chamber in the bowels of his castle. I think if we had been there, we would have seen Jesus wink when he delivered the last line. It was just a way of putting an exclamation point on his message to forgive. It was the punchline that affirms God's mercy with the irony and satire that the common man understood in relation to human kings. Jesus is not teaching us to be more forgiving than God is. Jesus is teaching us to be forgiving like God forgives us. The humor of the parable can break down our defenses and help us to see ourselves honestly. Where have we hardened our own hearts toward people who have the same struggles that we face? Why are we so slow to forgive when we also commit so many offenses? Is Jesus giving us permission to laugh at our own ridiculous pride? Yes, he is. May we receive 
the grace to cancel out the ledger entries that we hold against one another. Amen. Lord, we thank you that your mercy is new every morning, as the psalmist says, that you are eager to love us, that you desire to see us grow into that same kind of love that you have poured out into our lives. And we thank you that we can trust you and know that you are good, that your desire for us is good, not to be afraid, but to put ourselves wholeheartedly in your hands and to know um, that we are secure. We ask, Lord, for those who are facing difficult times, those who are ill, those who are suffering, those who are grieving, Lord, some in our congregation who have recently uh, faced the death of family, others who are receiving difficult news about their health, some who are lonely. Lord, we lift them to you. We pray again for our nation, for the world in the midst of this pandemic, and we give you thanks that things are progressing in terms of the distribution of the vaccine and that there is light at the end of the tunnel. We pray for those who continue to work so hard for the sake of others, sacrificing time with their own families and caring for the needs of others. Bless them, we pray, Lord. We pray for our nation in another pandemic, this pandemic of, of violence that erupts so frequently with mass shootings and terrible types of violence around our nation. We pray for the situation in Atlanta where so many Asian women were killed in this spa. And we ask, Lord, for your comfort and for your grace. We pray for the light of Christ to shine into the darkness of this world. And we pray now as Christ has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
receive this benediction today. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and to redeem, so God sends you into the world this day to be light and love, healing and hope. Go now to be light for the world and may the grace and peace of God, the creator, the redeemer and the sustainer come upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.